another conversation, again, related to COVID-19. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has tuned into these, these segments on a regular basis. Uh, talking with us with uh, yet another update is uh, State Representative Josh Cutler, who represents the 6th Plymouth District, which is Duxbury, Hanson, and Pembroke. Welcome back to The Fold, Representative. Hey, Kevin. Great to be back. Thanks for having us. Thanks for uh, having me. So I have to, right, right out of the box, here we are. Um, what are we, about, we about a month, five weeks in? I've, I've lost all track of time. I have no idea what day it is. So I'm sorry, I can't help you there. <laughs> what is it, what is it, I mean, what is it like as far as being a legislator, somebody who is a man of the people, who treks to, who will trek up to Boston, to the State House uh, on a regular basis, you know, a couple times a week, maybe more. What is, how has life changed for you? <laughs> I'm not really doing that much anymore. I'm mostly sitting in my house or I go to my office occasionally locally and doing a lot of uh, Zoom calls or FaceTime calls or uh, conference calls, uh, you name it. I've, I've, I've done it, as I'm sure many folks, many of your viewers and listeners are doing as well. It's definitely been an adjustment, but we're all, we're all doing the best we can to adjust to changing times and trying to make the best of it. So we're, we're trying to reach out and stay in touch with the constituents, but maybe more virtually than in, in face-to-face than, than I used to like to do. What do you think of the new normal? Because that, that's what this is. This is a new normal. And when, when we finally make it out pat on the other side of this pandemic, things I think are going to drastically change for our life as we've known it. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, this is, a, you know, this is not something I wished on anyone. Um, dealing with this, the economic, the health, uh, from every vantage, it's been you know, unprecedented challenges. You know, but there are silver linings. You got to find silver linings in everything. And I think, you know, we're trying to find some silver linings. It's forced us to maybe rethink about certain ways we do things, um, you know, delivering public services, uh, the way government operates, and, you know, trying to make the best out of challenging situations, just like we're doing right now, you know, having this, we used to, to do our shows face to face, and now we're doing them uh, laptop to laptop, and, um, you know, trying to do the best we can to persevere. And I think that's, everyone is, is, is finding those own challenges in their daily life and persevering as best as they can. And hopefully when this is, we're through all this and hopefully everyone comes through safe and sound that we can take those silver linings and, and, and maybe make things even better then. Um, but uh, obviously right now we're just focused on getting through the here and now. You were the first elected official that I, that I actually conducted a, a Zoom conference with <laughs> and, and used it in multiple, for, for multiple formats to be able to better inform people. Um, last time we, we had you on here, we were talking about businesses, how small business uh, businesses uh, were trying to uh, find a way to sustain, knowing that they could not offer Eden service. And I think there were provisions that were being offered by the state government since then. We've had conversations uh, with other individuals talking about what's being done on the federal level. What's your understanding as to what's being offered for, for assistance, whether it's an individual who is seeking unemployment or with that small business that is like, I can't be doing takeout because it's not my thing. Yeah. So um, thanks, Kevin. So the, you know, the good news is that there are a lot of different uh, forms of assistance available. Um, there really truly are. And I, I'd like to just quickly kind of go over a few of them because I think they're, they're important for folks to be aware of. Um, depending on your situation, you know, if you are, you know, uh, own a small business, and we know many folks here in the South Shore do, uh, if you're a sole proprietor, perhaps you're self-employed, or uh, what we call a gig economy, a, you know, a independent contractor who gets a 1099, or maybe you're sadly unemployed, or maybe you had to leave work for health reasons or to take care of a family member, you know, m no matter what your situation is, there are different forms of assistance, both at the state and federal level, and frankly, at the local level as well. Um, there to help. Uh, and the, the biggest ones that we get questions about, um, one is unemployment. Unfortunately, you know, we've seen a sharp spike in the number of people filing unemployment claims. Um, but the good news is that we have a robust unemployment benefits system here in Massachusetts that offers much more generous benefits than it does in, in other states. And on top of that, we've seen uh, Congress has passed something called the CARES Act, which many folks probably have now heard of a few times. And the CARES Act is, is a massive spending bill. It had $1.2 trillion and had a number of different programs within it, one of which is to convey, confer additional benefits for unemployment to the states, um, both to individuals who are what I would say traditional uh, claimants uh, who you know, maybe lost their job and, and had filed, but also to folks who 
uh, are self-employed or 1099 gig economy workers who traditionally would not have qualified for unemployment insurance because they're not, they're not paying into the system. But the CARES Act extended the coverage for them. So that's great news. Um, we're still waiting. Uh, we've been patient and getting a little frustrated on the timing of that. Um, the latest word is that that part of the program will be up and running uh, April 30th. We're all hoping and pushing that that will happen sooner for our uh, gig economy and self-employed workers. Um, the CARES Act does include an additional $600 a week in benefits for all folks who are on unemployment, including uh, folks who are already on employment and, and anyone who um, gets on through this uh, self-employed gig worker uh, provision. So that's a good thing as well. There's also a provision that to, would add an extra 13 weeks onto the, the length of unemployment to help folks um, who are more in, in a more extended um, need. So those are all things that um, um, are happening now, some of which are already in place, some of which will be operational as soon as uh, you know, the right logistical hurdles are, are uh, handled at the state level. Uh, and we know our folks, and I should say, Kevin, um, our unemployment department has, has been doing you know, a tremendous volume. They used to have, I'm told, about 50 employees in their call centers, and they now have up to 500, and they've really scaled up quickly. So I know folks sometimes get frustrated not getting a call back and not getting an email back. Uh, I would just say, please be patient. Uh, please call me if we can help. We are seeing that people are getting their cases handled, though. It takes a little bit of time. But it's happening and people are getting their benefits and people are qualifying. So that is happening. The system is working just a little slower than, than we would like. Um, so unemployment is one major area. And I would say also um, when we're talking about unemployment, if you're in a situation where maybe you, you are no longer able to go to work uh, because of he legitimate health concerns or maybe you were furloughed or maybe there's been a quarantine, uh, they've expanded the accessibility of unemployment. So where, where normally you may not typically have qualified for unemployment, uh, in, mo in most cases, you would now today. So if that remotely fits your situation, I would really strongly encourage everyone to go to mass.gov and, and follow the, the prompts to check out unemployment and, and see if that is an option that works for you. So for many, in, in almost all instances, there's a lot of flexibility. So in almost all instances, such as I've just mentioned, you would be eligible. So it definitely pays to, to check that out. Um, so unemployment is one big part of this puzzle. Um, there's a lot of other forms of assistance too, Kevin. Um, one thing I just wanna mention, um, it's probably been mentioned by others, but the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP. Uh, we got all these new acronyms. We had PPE, and now we have PPP. Uh, and the Paycheck Protection Program was part of the CARES Act. And that is a, um, it's called a loan, but it is really a grant because it's, it's, it's really uh, money that in most cases does not need to be paid back uh, to small businesses, to the self-employed, and to independent contractors. And uh, in, in a nutshell, it takes a formula, uh, you can borrow up to $10 million, but it's capped at uh, a formula that basically looks at your average monthly payroll and multiplies it by two and a half. So if your average monthly payroll uh, is, uh, you know, say $10,000, you'd multiply that by 2.5, and that's how much you can borrow, okay? So in that scenario, $25,000 you could borrow. Um, now, the nice thing about this is, number one, it's the easiest loan to qualify for because there's no, uh, no uh, credit check, there's no person, uh, no lender origination fees, there's no, um, none of the collateral, there's no collateral, none of the provisions of a typical loan uh, are in effect. So it's easy to qualify for, but the even better part is that there's a forgiveness provision that says basically you can forgive almost 100% of that loan under a couple uh, criteria. And basically with, with what those criteria are is over the next eight weeks from the period that you get the loan, um, if you keep your payroll costs intact and are continuing to pay your employees, you can take, um, so let's say under my scenario, let, let's make it simpler. Let's say we borrowed $100,000, okay? Over the next eight weeks, you look at your payroll costs and the formula is 75%, uh, you, can, you can forgive 75% of that loan attributable to your payroll costs and 25% attributable to rent or mortgage plus your utilities and any uh, debt interest payments that you had before February. So you take those numbers. So let's say you had a payroll, of um, $100,000 and you had a loan of $100,000, you could actually have that whole amount forgiven if you uh, measured it over that eight week period. So that is a, a, a extremely generous uh, provision, uh, a great fit for small businesses. And when I say small businesses, it applies to businesses of 500 or fewer. So almost every business here on the South Shore would qualify, includes nonprofits. And it, again, it does, it does include self-employed and independent contractors. So again, 
great options for folks. So it's basically a loan that you don't have to pay back. Um, so it's a pretty good deal. Uh, the, the downside, I guess, if there is one, is that uh, it's very popular and you have to go through your local bank to apply. Banks are getting you know, massive number of, 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 of applications. And so many banks are only um, allowing current customers, current loan customers in many cases, to, um, to take out you know, to, to do an application through them. Some banks are a little more flexible, but it really is important to talk to your local banker, someone you have a banking relationship with, um, because it's just so oversubscribed. And we know, even though Congress appropriated, I believe, $250 billion for this, uh, it's gonna go quick. And, um, you know, it, it pays to be to get in line quick and to move ahead. So those are just a couple of things. There's a lot of other programs as well, but I'll, I'll stop there and let you get into another question, but I want to make sure people are aware. Anybody who's listening, if, you, if you're a self-employed, uh, independent contractor, run a small business, you should 100% go talk to your local bank about the PPP loan because it's, it's something that really could be a huge benefit. No, so I'm going to ask you this. And again, we're speaking with State Representative Josh Kotler, who's uh, uh, kind enough to make himself available to various media outlets and, and various uh, folks to kind of get the information out there. He's a facilitator of, of information, I guess that comes from having a, um, uh, having a owned a family uh, run newspaper. So he kind of understands the, the importance of uh, disseminating information to, to a, a large num a number of people. Um, we ha we've had actually um, um, guests on who have actually said the very same thing you said is, is that the banks are, are getting inundated and that it's a matter of being patient. I've seen posts on social media with business, biz, you know, business owners are going, has anybody else had any, any trouble with uh, bank X or ba bank Y where I call them and it's just going to voicemail and the voicemail is filled. Um, is it just a matter of patience to, to, to wait your turn? Is it a matter of trying to send an email? What would you give for advice for folks who want to get in line with this? Uh, so as far as the PPP loan, I mean, I think, you know, I, their patience is appropriate, but I also think it's important to be the, the, to be the squeaky wheel and to be persistent um, and to make sure, you know, to be obviously polite, but, but persistent uh, to, to, you know, and it's helpful if you have an established relationship with the local bank, you know, that's going to go a long way if you've already taken out a loan in the past, or if maybe you have an accounts there and have that relationship, that's going to be very helpful. If you don't have that, it is more challenging because, you know, there, there is, there are so many people who are trying to apply and the pool of money is limited. Um, so that is the challenge. I think, you know, Congress, when they're going to revisit this, they may need to make some tweaks to the way it is administered because um, the banks, you know, are a key part of this. And if they're not, you know, able or willing to, to, to make the loans, it's going to, it's not, the money's not going to get to the people who need it. Um, so I would definitely say it pays to talk to, talk to different banks, shop around. Don't just, if you're not getting interest from one bank, go to another, uh, but definitely go to, um, this is another plug, I guess, for it's important, it's as, um, anytime, I think, is dealing with local banks. I'm a big fan, I'm not gonna mention any bank names, but I think you know, dealing with people locally is always better. When you deal with national banks, you just, you're just a face in the crowd. But if you're dealing with a local bank where you can actually talk to somebody, I think you're always gonna have a better outcome, and that's true with this as with anything. So shop local, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so is a strict, so I wanna make sure that the PPP is strictly through a bank, you can't go to a government website to find out information and apply. It's strictly bank driven. So you can get information. There's plenty of information available on the SBA, but yes, that's correct, Kevin. It is a, it is, SBA is, is not administering the program. I mean, they're, they're giving the guidelines to the banks. It's the banks that are lending the money. So there is, not to confuse things, there is another program called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. I always have trouble with that, EIDL. And that is administered through the SBA, the Small Business Administration. And so you would apply directly to them, the EIDL. And they have another provision called the Emergency Advance, which is nice, which you can get up to, and I'll say stress that, up to $10,000 emergency advance. It's supposed to be distributed within three days, although that isn't happening. Um, and you don't have to pay that back. So it's essentially another grant uh, with, without strings. Um, now, a couple of caveats. Uh, that, so that is something you apply through the SBA. You can go to the SBA website uh, and the way it works, it's a little confusing, but you're basically applying for a loan and then you can check one box that says you want to apply for the emergency advance. Uh, you're not obligated to take the loan if you get the advance. So you could just take the advance and then not take out the loan and get you know, the money that you don't have to pay back. Um, 
they have been a little bit. Um, so number one, I'd say that I don't know of anyone who's actually gotten the money yet on that. They're they're having uh, capacity issues as well. So that is taking longer. I think that's taking even longer than the Paycheck Protection Program in some cases. The other thing is it's very unclear. They haven't. The SBA has not been explicit about how they're going to calculate that emergency advance. I've heard in, in some circles that it's basically going to be a formula of the number of employees times $1,000. So if you had a cap at $10,000, so if you had five employees, you could apply and get $5,000 emergency advance that you didn't have to pay back. If you had uh, 10, you could get 10,000. If you had 12, you'd still get just 10,000. Um, if you were just had one or two though, you'd get a, a smaller amount. Um, that has not been explicitly stated by the SBA, so that is subject to change and it's been hard to get kind of firm, um, explicit uh, guidance on that. Um, but the economic industry injury disaster loan is definitely another option for folks should take a look at. Um, you can do both. You can't double dip though, so that if you got uh, an amount from the um, emergency advance, that would be counted against your PPP loan. So you can still do both, but you're just not gonna be able to get both, um, you know, both sets of free money, so to speak. Uh, but definitely EIDL, if you Google that, that is definitely worth taking a look at as well. And I, I should mention, Kevin, both, you know, some businesses may actually need, uh, you know, more than just a small uh, pot of money. They may need a larger amount to keep their business sustained and to keep paying their employees over an extended period of time. And so, you know, both of these have low interest loan provisions. The SBA uh, loans are, are very favorable. They have uh, low interest rates, uh, terms up to 20 years. So if you need some capital um, to keep your business going for, you know, maybe six months a year, um, that's one way to do so. The Paycheck Protection Program also, uh, if, you're, if your loan isn't 100% forgiven, it turns into a traditional loan, but it has a 1% interest rate and it's payable over two years. So it, it's still an attractive thing. And oh, by the way, it has, there's no prepayment penalty. So if you don't end up needing all the money and you don't get it all forgiven, you can just pay it back and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're done. So um, two really good options, the, the EIDL and the PPP, not to be throw too many acronyms out there, but um, I think those are both really good options for folks. And again, not just big business, these are small businesses, sole proprietorships, self-employed, and independent contractors are all eligible for both of those uh, types of loans and uh, grants. So I, I asked this uh, question uh, during an earlier conversation with the State Senator Patrick O'Connor, who I know you work extensively with, yep. um, knowing that this, this is budget season, and, and I believe that <laughs> it, it was, and I think I believe that, it, that the House was up um, to discuss this. I know you're a member of the, 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 the Ways and Means Committee, and, you know, where do, where, does, where do things um, stand as far as uh, putting a budget together? Is this something that has been backburnered and, and you, the state's going to have to figure it out when the, the smoke clears? Yeah, so great question. So this time of year, Kevin, traditionally is when, in fact, uh, this is the week usually when the House Ways and Means budget, budget is, is issued. Right. And then we, you know, as, as legislators have an opportunity to file amendments and to try to make our you know, case for various line items. Um, so that obviously is not happening. Uh, that is on the back burner, as you say, um, for a couple of reasons. One is from a process point of view, you know, we um, still are, you know, state government, first of all, it's important to know the state government is still operating. We're still uh, able to, you know, advance legislation and working with Governor Baker. And, you know, I have to say there's been a very nice spirit of, of bipartisanship and cooperation, I would say. And, you know, I think we typically have that here in Massachusetts, uh, unlike our colleagues, perhaps in Washington. Uh, but to the extent that this, you know, COVID-19 has happened, it's, it's been, you know, to, to an unprecedented level, I would say, because um, we're all operating on basically on what's called unanimous consent to get any legislation done. Um, but so the budget process itself has been delayed because we're not able to have our traditional hearings and meetings right now. We're not able to take our traditional, you know, roll call votes even at, in the chamber. We're working on different scenarios to address that in a, in a different way. Um, but but more than that, Kevin, you know, just the, the putting aside the process issues, the fiscal issues are, are even bigger. We, you know, we, we previously in a, were working on a set of numbers based in, you know, projections that were made in December and January about what kind of revenues we'd have for the next fiscal year. And again, you know, unlike, again, like, unlike our federal government, we actually have to have a, a balanced budget at the state level. We can't spend more than we take in. And so, you know, when we look at what our projections were in December and January and start to sketch out what our budget looks like for FY21, well, all of a sudden that is just, those numbers are meaningless. 
Uh, and now we need to really go back and figure out what are we, you know, realistically going to be looking at for new revenues. And it's very difficult to do right now. We're in the middle of this crisis. Um, and so trying to determine what kind of fiscal impact this is going to have, you know, for the next 12 months is really difficult. So you can imagine, uh, and, and not only for the next fiscal year, which would start in July, but for the fiscal year we're in, because keep in mind, we're, you know, we're, we're not through this fiscal year. And, um, you know, it's April now. And so we still have a couple of months left of this fiscal year. And obviously there's going to be an impact on the revenues that we were expecting to have in for this fiscal year to pay for things. Um, and oh, by the way, you know, we've now seen our uh, unemployment insurance, you know, quintuple or e even higher. Uh, our costs for many, many things have gone have skyrocketed. Um, so it's going to be a challenging budget year. Um, but the first step is really going to be just assessing where we're at. Um, and we don't know yet. I can tell you that um, uh, this Wednesday, excuse me, there's going to be a, a, what's called a consensus revenue hearing, um, a revised consensus revenue hearing. We had one in, in December and January. This is going to be a, a revision to kind of take first pass look at, hey, where do we think we're at now, um, given what's happening? And, you know, we bring in some of the state's top uh, ec economists and fiscal experts to, to present testimony. And of course, we're going to be doing this all virtually now. Um, and we'll hear what they have to say. And, you know, that will at least be the first uh, steps towards formulating the budget and trying to get a better handle on where we're at. Although, I, you know, I have to say, I can't imagine you could make too accurate a forecast right now uh, where we're going to be at, you know, 10 months from now. Um, so it's going to be a challenge for sure. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, I was going to, so while we're talking budget <clears throat> and knowing that, you know, come, Come July one, we could be looking at you know one twelfth budgets in order to get through, depending on where we're at with flattening the curve in the COVID nineteen situation. Um, for the past several years, the state has done its best to make sure it's had anywhere between um, a half a billion dollars to upwards of two billion dollars in its stabilization fund. Is this is this a perfect time for for the state to have to utilize something like its stabilization fund, or is it a matter of you wait until, because I know it's also, there are other attributes to the stabilization fund as it, it can spell, you know, um, having that money's in there, it helps as far as bonding rates. There's so many other residuals to come to having money stored, squirreled away. Um, talk to me about the, the stabilization fund uh, that the state has, and is it something that is, that is being discussed or, could potentially be discussed in the coming weeks? Yeah, no, great question, Kevin. So yeah, Massachusetts has a, what we call a stabilization fund or more sometimes called a rainy day fund for, for, for more common term. Um, and our, our, our rainy day fund is over $3 billion. So we, we've, um, we've made some investments in that over the past five years to really boost that up. Um, back during the, the Great Recession, obviously that was, that was eaten into quite a bit. Uh, and we've replenished that. And obviously, you know, a rainy day fund, I would say it's raining. Um, we're going to need some of those funds. And there's no doubt about that. Uh, that is a nice cushion to have. It is not going to sustain everything. Uh, $3 billion, you know, can get eaten up fairly quickly. And as you, as you pointed out, um, there is a provision, obviously, you know, our fiscal health and our ability to bond and to borrow money to pay for things, um, whether it's COVID related or just, you know, road projects and, and so forth, depends on having a, a good credit rating and depends on having, uh, you know, reserves, stabilization funds. So we can't just eat into that entirely. We do need to keep some sort of stabilization in order to have uh, the bonding capacity to, to, to borrow for things that we need to, to cover our everyday needs. Um, but obviously, I think Massachusetts, better than, than many states, um, I think for a variety of reasons, uh, is, it is better situated to weather this storm, both from a fiscal point of view, also because of our, you know, our health expertise. And you know, I think we have good leadership uh, on that front. But um, certainly the, the stabilization fund is, is something that I'm sure we're going to be looking at as a way to help stabilize uh, our budget. But it's not going to be, you know, it can't be the only solution. But certainly um, it's helpful to have. <laughs> I'll say that. And if, there's ever, if there was ever a break glass in case of emergency kind of moment, this is it. So we got just a couple of minutes left with you. Uh, anything we haven't touched upon, but you want to. You a wanna, lot. <laughs> I know. I know. There's so much. Uh, but but if you could seize upon one particular item or two in the next three to four minutes, what would you make sure you touch upon while while we have you? Sure. Well, I just want to you know run down obviously a um, number of things. Obviously, uh, getting back to the unemployment for folks who have questions about unemployment, 
The Department of Unemployment Assistance has uh, these virtual town halls, much like this format right here, Kevin, through Zoom and other platforms, and they do them every day. And so anyone who has questions about uh, applying or how to go through all the steps, I would really strongly encourage you to sit and watch one of those uh, virtual town halls. You can sign up on the mass.gov website and they have one every morning, it's usually in the morning, uh, sometimes on the weekend, and they have them on the weekends too. So virtual town hall for the Department of Unemployment Assistance. Also would just recommend folks who wanna get text updates on sort of the latest uh, happenings. You can text uh, COVIDMA, COVIDMA. You can text that to 888-777 and you'll get uh, text alerts on your phone. And you know, they're not all, the, they don't inundate you, but they give you updates. Uh, I do that and uh, they're very helpful to get. Um, and then also we have the 211 system. People can call the 211 system if they wanna talk to a live person that's operated 24 seven and they can um, steer you in the right direction and kind of get you some uh, baseline information about, uh, about COVID related stuff or really anything if you have questions about that. Um, those are just some of the resources that are out there. Um, just in terms of other quick updates, I just let you know. Um, so, you know, again, we're still expecting, governors talked about this, this surge to be happening, surge in cases uh, right now through really April 20th, maybe more towards the 20th. Um, we've seen the latest stats out um, show that we've had, um, uh, here, well, here in Plymouth County, we've had uh, over 1,600 cases, positive cases. We've had, we've sadly, we've had 46 deaths uh, statewide where we've had 20, more than 21,000 cases and just about 600 deaths. Um, we're seeing a lot of issues with our long-term care facilities and we're doing, putting extra attention on them. Uh, there've been 247 deaths in our long-term care facilities and we've brought in the National Guard and have uh, rapid testing sites we're setting up, and I know our long-term care facilities are very being very vigilant about this. They're obviously an extremely extremely at-risk population. Um, further, in terms of beds, we're anticipating obviously the need for more uh, beds. There are now 14,500 ICU beds available um, around the state. We're also setting up five more additional field hospitals, including one uh, on the Cape, um, that will give us more uh, capacity. Uh, right now, we're we're using about 45% of our beds. So we do have some capacity. We're going to need it though. Um, in terms of PPE, we did just get uh, some more uh, 100 new ventilators. We're expecting another 110 uh, today. So lots going on. Um, and I know we could probably do a whole hour show. I know we're just about out of time, but I would suggest the folks who want to um, reach me to, to give me a, to check out my website, joshcutler.com or send an email josh.cutler at mahouse.gov. We're trying to help as many folks as we can and encourage anyone who needs help, uh, whether you're in my district to reach out to me or to, if you're living in a different district to reach out to your own representatives. We're really you know, here to help and this is when we, this is when we, you know, we, uh, we're in our pay, I guess. So we, we wanna help and, and encourage folks to, to reach out and, and let us know what we can do to help. Representative Cutler, thank you so much for always being accessible, not only uh, to this program, but uh, other modes of, uh, of media, whether it's uh, PAC TV or, or another radio state, uh, radio show on this station. Uh, you're always uh, generous with your time. We appreciate Thanks, it. Kevin. I, I got to give a plug I, I, for your viewers on, who can see this. My background is Ferry Sunoco in, in Hanson, a uh, beautiful mural that was drawn. So it's a little bit better than my office, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a mural in my back. My, yeah, you need I to do better. You need to raise your mural yeah. your background okay, game. I will. I'll raise it. But, but thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And, and thank you, uh, folks, for, for tuning in for this particular segment.